What's up everybody and welcome to part two of my basics of deep learning series. In the previous video we have seen that two important aspects that you need to consider when thinking about any supervised machine learning algorithm are how does the algorithm make a decision and second how do you determine the right parameters for the algorithm. And we've also seen that this first aspect is a little bit less heavily based on math and it's more about the conceptual idea behind the algorithm, whereas the second aspect is then more heavily based on math. And now in this video, we are going to answer this first question for the deep learning algorithm. So what's the conceptual idea behind deep learning? Well, the idea is pretty straightforward, namely we as humans make decisions all the time and we use our brain to do that. And the problem with this idea, however, is that the brain is extremely complex and still today we don't really know how it works in detail. And on top of that, um, the basics of deep learning were invented in the 1940s. And clearly back then they knew even less about the brain. So deep learning consequently must be an extreme oversimplification, oversimplification of how the brain works. You should think of it as being loosely inspired by how the brain works rather than being an actual representation of the brain. Okay, so that being said, how does the brain generally work? Well, um, the basic fundamental anatomical unit of the brain is the neuron. And this is a cell that consists of some dendrites here at the front, then a soma or cell body, and then here at the end, an exon with exon terminals. And all the cell can really do is create an electrical signal. So it's basically just like a switch. It's either on and fires or it is off and doesn't fire. And of such neurons, we have billions in our brain and they are organized in networks, hence the term neural network. And how they now interact is that, for example, this neuron receives the electrical signals from all the neurons that are connected to its dendrites. And then those signals are added up in the soma. And if that sum then exceeds a certain threshold level, then this neuron is triggered to create an electrical signal itself. And that is then sent through the exon and the exon terminals to all the other neurons that this particular neuron is connected to. And those neurons then in turn process the signal in the same way. So that's how neurons generally interact. But how do they now make a decision? And here it turns out that certain areas in the brain, so certain subnetworks of neurons, are responsible for executing specific tasks. So let's say, for example, that this network here is a slice of a brain from a bird. Those neurons here at the front, they receive some sensory input, so they get activated based on what the bird sees. And the single neuron here at the end, this is going to be responsible for making the bird peck at whatever it sees. So if this neuron is firing, the bird is going to peck. And if it's not firing, the bird is not going to peck. And again, normally this would be a whole subnetwork of neurons. But let's just say for now that this single neuron is enough to make the bird peck at something. So now let's say the bird sees some berries. Then in this case, these particular neurons get activated and they then activate some of their subsequent neurons. And those neurons then in turn activate some of their subsequent neurons. And then finally, this last neuron uh, gets triggered and it fires. So the bird's going to peck at these berries. And now let's say the bird sees some other berries. In this case, uh, different neurons here at the front get activated. And this leads to the fact that a different combination of neurons is on and off. Uh, but in this case, uh, the last neuron also fires, so the bird is also going to peck at these berries. And what this means is that different particular combinations uh, of active and inactive neurons, like we've seen here, can lead to the same decision. And it's not just like, for example, that this particular set of active neurons will make the bird peck at something. And now let's also look at a counter example. So let's say the bird sees some little stones. In this case, 
uh, this particular set of neurons is activated and the bird uh, therefore doesn't peck at these stones. So to conclude, how the brain or the bird makes a decision is based on what particular set of neurons is active. And but this now raises the question, how did it come about that in all of those different situations, the bird made the right decision? Or in other words, how did it come about that the right set of uh, neurons was activated? Uh, one <coughs> possible explanation could be that all those different sets of activated neurons were already hardwired into the brain of the bird from the moment it was born. But obviously then the bird couldn't adapt to a changing environment. So let's say, for example, it flies to a new territory and there it sees a different type of berry. If now the decision to peck at this berry wasn't already hardwired into the brain, the, then the bird couldn't take advantage of this additional food supply. So clearly building in the capacity for learning into the brain uh, would be highly beneficial for the bird's survival. Because then, uh, that way then, it could adapt to a changing environment and therefore then learn the right decisions in different situations. So now, how is this learning process ensured? Well, that's what uh, synapses are for. And that's because those uh, exon terminals and the dendrites, they aren't actually connected directly to each other, but they are connected via such synapses. And based on the strength of those synaptic connections, the signal going from that neuron to that neuron gets either amplified if uh, the connection is strong or it gets weakened if the connection is weak. And furthermore, those uh, synapses could also be inhibitory, which means if that neuron is firing, then the sum of electrical signal that reaches this neuron is reduced somewhat. So that way, with an inhibitory uh, synapse, a neuron can actively inhibit another neuron from firing. So what the learning process is basically about is adjusting the strength of those synaptic connections in order to influence what specific neurons are active or inactive, and thereby then uh, in turn influence the final decision. And how that learning process actually occurs in the brain is not really important for us. But the only important thing to know is that by changing the strength of those connections, we can influence the final decision. So that's now how neurons in the brain uh, basically work at a high level. And again, this is an extreme oversimplification, but this is, so to say, the essence of it. And this is also what serves as the conceptual idea behind deep learning. So now we can start to uh, model such a neural net in a mathematical way. And since the basic uh, fundamental unit of a brain is the neuron, this is what we're going to model mathematically with our artificial neuron. So to recap, the neuron receives some electrical signals via its dendrites. And for our artificial neuron, those signals are going to be our input values, so the features of the data set, or if this neuron is located somewhere deeper in the net, then those input values are going to be the outputs of other neurons. And then <coughs> uh, those electrical signals get, add, get add up in the SOMA. So we also simply add up those values. And then if this sum crosses a certain threshold, then this neuron is triggered to fire. And the way we are going to represent that is with, an, uh, with something called an activation function. In this case, it's a step function. So if the sum is smaller than two, then the function returns a zero. And if the sum is bigger or equal to two, then the function returns a one. And this zero and one is our way of representing if the neuron is firing or not. So uh, the one represents that it is firing and the zero that it's not firing. And now to represent those synapses, we're simply going to multiply each input value with an individual weight. So if this weight is, for example, between 0 and 1, then this input value gets weakened, so it gets smaller. And if that uh, weight is bigger than 1, then 
this input value uh, gets amplified or it gets bigger. And if this weight is negative, so if it represents an inhibitory uh, synapse, then this input value is going to be negative and then the sum is going, going to be reduced somewhat and then uh, the neuron is less likely to reach its threshold level. So this is how we mathematically model our biological neuron. And now to see how it works, let's look at some examples. So let's say the input values are 2, 0 0.5 and 1, and the weights are 0 0.9, 1 and 0 0.3. Then what we want to do is to multiply this value with that, this value with this weight, and this value with that weight. And then we add up those products. So basically what we are calculating is a weighted sum. In this case, the weighted sum is 2.6. And that sum we then put into our uh, activation function. And since the sum is bigger than 2, the function is going to return a 1. And accordingly, then the output of our neuron is going to be a 1. And now let's say that this weight is not 0 0.9, but 0 0.2. Then the weighted sum would be 1.2. And accordingly, the neuron would output a zero. So that's how our artificial uh, neuron works. And now to really indicate that it is one functional unit, let's combine those two circuits into one. And then we just assume that those converging lines mean that we add up those products. And now if we put together many of such neurons, we're going to get an artificial neural net. And here I'm going to remove those lines representing our activation function and also those arrows. This way the net is a little bit less cluttered and this is also how neural nets are generally depicted if you look at other resources. And you then just have to keep in mind that uh, those nodes uh, include an activation function and that the information flows in this way. And now as you can see in this diagram those nodes are all uh, organized in layers. This first layer is called the input layer. And oftentimes you will see that this layer is also depicted using such circuits. But I prefer to, to depict it this way because that way it's really clear that those aren't really nodes that receive some input and some, uh, create some output. Those are just some input values. So the features of our data set. And then accordingly, this last layer is called the output layer. And every layer in between those two layers is called the hidden layer. And if you have more than one, then the neural net is called a deep neural net, hence the term deep learning. And now uh, one other thing that I would like you to notice is that each neuron in a layer is connected to all the neurons in the subsequent layer. So now we can use this uh, artificial neural net just like we used our biological neural net to make a decision. So what we do is we simply uh, put in our input data, so our, uh, the features of our data set, and then for each node, these input values are going to be processed in the way we saw with this single neuron. And then the outputs of these nodes, they then serve as the inputs for the nodes in the next layer. In this way, we keep going through the layers until we reach the last layer to get the output of the neural net. And this is something called feed forward, because we are, so to say, feeding forward our input data through the net to get the decision. And with that now, we have finally answered the question, how the deep learning algorithm makes a decision, namely with this feed forward algorithm. So now, we can start to implement this feed forward algorithm in code and how to do that uh, we're going to do in the upcoming video. Uh, so thanks for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next video.